everybody. A happy New Year and welcome to this year's first edition of the Interview Chair brought to you by K9 Chronicle TV and ProPlan. Our first guest in the chair is none other than Polly Smith. So sit back and relax and listen to Polly for a while. Hi, everybody. Will Alexander here with this week's interview chair, the first one in 2024. And our special guest is Polly Smith. How are you, Polly? I'm fine. How are you, Will? I'm great. It's good to see you. I haven't seen you in so long. <laughs> Seems like forever. <laughs> it does. It does. Did you have a good holiday? I had a wonderful holiday, yes. Excellent, excellent. Fam uh, friends and family, I suppose. <laughs> So family. Yeah. I was out in Arkansas with my family. Oh, wow. That'll be fun. All right. Well, I'm going to get started, Polly. I'm going to ask you the first question. How did you get started in the sport of dogs? And if you don't mind telling us how old you were as well. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's a very strange way that I got started in dogs. Um, my parents were divorced, so my grandparents raised me. And they had left the farm and moved down to Columbia Pike outside Ellicott City. And so my grandmother would send me next door. Our neighbor was a former teacher. And she tutored me, and she happened to have chow chows. So in order to get me to study, then I would get to play dog show with the chow chows after <laughs> I'd studied in the morning. And the first dog I showed was a chow puppy, and it was I was four years old at the time. Wow. My and then I started school, and, and I always was interested in the dogs because of the chows. And where did it go from there? Well, also at that time, on Columbia Pike were two kennels. Uh, Bill Tooten, who was a well-known bulldog breeder judge, had a bulldog kennel down right outside Ellicott City. And then the Knoppenbergers, who bred collies, lived about two doors up from us. And Mr. Tooten would come up. He was a great friend of my grandfather's, and he would bring the bulldog puppies and sort of played with them and visited. And then I, the Knoppenbergers always had puppies, and I fooled with some of those, too. So, And then I went to school and went to college and got into fox hunting and... Um, and you're jump, you're going too fast now. So when did you get into fox hunting? So all through school, you didn't you didn't have much to do with the sport of dogs. Uh, well, no, not in grade school. I really didn't. I was studying, and I was down at a uh, all girls school, and later a girls convent school. So, but then I got a horse. I I was more into riding when I was in school than I was into showing dogs. So when did you start back into the sport of dogs? So what made you what made you think, oh I, I missed I missed the sport of dogs. I need to Well, when I got married, I had to get rid of my horse. When were so you then, married? Huh? When were you married? We were married in 1960. So we're talking about Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob, that's yeah. right. <laughs> and I had to sell my horse. So uh, I then went, I, I got Bob a dog. Actually, he was working for Social Security. 
and he got a chance to go back to graduate school. One of his professors had taken over the political science department at the University of South Carolina and invited Bob to come back. And we went down there. And I ended up getting a German Shepherd puppy. And then we met Lucy Bostick, who is a well-known Cocker Spaniel breeder and ran the um, Columbia Kennel Club. Did Dr. And Bob know what was in store for him at this point when you no, got the German Shepherd? No, no, Dr. <laughs> Bob had no idea and not much interest in any of this, let me tell you. <laughs> and uh, we got into the Columbia Kennel Club and that kind of started us into showing dogs. And actually, I showed the German Shepherds. Bob really didn't show them at all. So... <laughs> So then the, did you have Cockers too? Is that where you went from? No, no. Oh. We, Bob was at um, South Carolina for two years. And then he went on to Vanderbilt to uh, get his PhD at Vanderbilt. And we got into the Nashville Kennel Club. And I actually was doing, I showed in confirmation, not, very successfully and we also did obedience and then Bob got more active in showing and um, to get to the foxhounds was through Becky Trotter who was Chuck Trotter's first wife oh. she showed a foxhound for Dr. Fred Vaught and that's where we got our first foxhound from and what year would that have been Oh, that was about 63. Yeah. Actually, we had, Bob had finished at Vanderbilt and moved up to Kalamazoo, Michigan to teach at Western Michigan. And I got Bob, at that time we had two, two German Shepherds and a mixed breed dog. And I got Bob an American Foxhound as a Christmas gift. And, and how did it go over? It went over okay. He <laughs> showed it. He showed it at a puppy match, and he won the puppy match. And Tony Stam said to him and to me, "Well, that's the end of German Shepherds. You all are going to be in Foxhounds <laughs> because Bob liked to win." <laughs> <laughs> oh, exactly. Well, we and, all the like to win. and the Foxhound was much better than the German Shepherds we had. But we stayed involved with the German Shepherds. We were in the Wolverine German Shepherd Club and good friends of Stu and Bernice Stahl. So we stayed closely involved with them. So how how so you, you, did you start breeding foxhounds at that point or did you who was this first dog you you got was he was it a male or female it was a male the first dog we got was a puppy dog he was about four months old when we got him and we took him with some matches and then we started showing him. And a lot, and after we, I showed him some, and then Bob showed him some, and then we discussed it. And Bob was a better. Now, I could handle one of your dogs, a new fawn, <laughs> but with my dogs, I can tell you stories later of disasters in the ring with the foxhound. But I want to hear those. Not not many people knew what an American foxhound was at that time up in the Midwest. And we decided it would be better if just one of us showed showed the dog. So then Bob started showing them. And he had some success, obviously. A little. <laughs> when did you start breeding them? We started up in Michigan. We actually, um, Fred Vaught sold us. He was getting sick at the time, and he sold us a dog called High Society that he had done some winning with on the bench. 
and um, had not shown NAKC shows. And she actually was that foundation bitch. And she really lived up to her name. She was actually better than the dog we showed, but she did not want to show. She did not want to show AKC style. Mm -hmm. And that made it very difficult to show her. She did finish her championship, and she produced four um, multiple best in show winners. Wow. So <laughs> That's incredible. It, 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 she was that that, that was your foundation, bitch, and she did. She produced four best of show winners. Right. Wow. Right. It's a good start. <laughs> it wasn't a bad start. No. <laughs> so how, how did you ever actively campaign a foxhound? Well, we did. We uh, cam. I mean, if you didn't show in the group, there certainly wasn't much sense of just finishing foxhounds right. because you could finish anything you had. You just had to bring enough foxhound puppies to do it. So yes, we showed, but campaign. I we showed locally and in the particularly in the Michigan, Wisconsin. Illinois, Pennsylvania, Ohio area, we showed at almost all the shows up there. And we went out to Westminster and Westchester shows like that. Okay. But I mean, um, Bob worked. So if there were shows like they have now, no, we couldn't do that because we would leave on... Friday night and come back on Sunday night. So, yeah, it's, it's amazing how, how they do it now. Just so many shows. Oh, oh. I, it's too many shows. Well, yeah. it's just too many shows. Yeah, we've talked about that before. Um, so, how, when did you guys decide? To, when did you two decide to you want to take your hand at judging? Um, we had moved to Mississippi, and we were very active in showing dogs and so forth. I guess it was before we moved. Len Brumby saw Bob showing the dogs, and he went up and talked with him and said he thought it was time that Bob looked at, at first asked him if he was interested in judging. And then told him he thought it was time for him to look into it and start judging. And Bob did, and he got American Fox Sounds and Beagles. And that was the start of Bob's career. I, on the other, I was still raising Stuart. I still had the dogs. And quite frankly, I was much more interested in showing the dogs than judging. And, um, Bob often said that he could have had his Aubrey license sooner, but when people would ask me, I would say, who's judging the hound group? And then I would say, oh, no, he can't do that. Sorry. <laughs> so so that, he, start he, started, oh. he started back in the early 70s judging. Okay. And what did you it, I didn't start until um, it took Bob about 10 years to get his first group. And then at that time, AKC was not particularly fond of people who judge groups showing dogs that much. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, we sort of closed down breeding, and I decided, well, if I wasn't going to do this, then I ought to look into judging. And so what I started. What year was that? It was, I started looking into it in 79, 79 and 80, and started judging, getting one breed or two breeds at the time. So, um your camera is speaking on me. Can, uh, you, can you just hold your camera up again properly? I'll yeah, I'm having trouble right now. Something came up. Uh-oh. 
So hold on. Okay, I'll pause this then. There. How's that? Good? Okay, good. Yeah. That's good. Okay, we're back. <laughs> so you started judging approximately 1979. Right. And at that time, you got one, well, you had to wait six months or a year before you could apply for any more breeds. And they'd give you one breed at a time and one breed. And it took me, oh, it didn't take me as long to get my breeds as it took Bob, actually. And I start, and then after I got the hound group, I went into the working group because a very close friend of mine who we had gotten started in dogs had a ketus, and I fell in love with the ketus. And uh, I decided I would go into the working group then. And that was my second group. And that went fairly fast. Oh, good. I'm going to backtrack a bit. I, I, did, I, I didn't ask you because you brought up this person with the Akitas. What about your mentors while you were going through all this? Did you have any mentors that you leaned on that helped you get through this, even the process of the fox sound and the showing dogs? Oh, we had a lot of people that helped us a great deal, particularly in the Michigan area. Um, Tony Stam was a great help to us. Gene Hawk, who was a great help to us. Dick Becker. Um, Dick Becker, he was a great guy. <laughs> he was a wonderful man. Actually, we ended up getting, Dick Becker ended up with Beagle called Jimmy Beagle. And he was a, um, um, brother to the triple tri threat dog. Oh, wow. Okay, I didn't know that. And a number of people had had this dog, and Dick ended up with him, and he didn't want him anymore, so he gave him to us for our son to show. And so that's how we ended up with Jimmy Beagle. It was absolutely a wonderful dog. He yeah. really was. Wow. It's part of Beagle history. <laughs> right, right. It's funny because when I was growing up, I grew up, my parents had Irish setters and English cockers. So Dick Becker was one of my childhood heroes as, as a handler showing English cockers. So Here, are we back now? Yeah, we're good. We're on. We're still going. So. So I, um, you had those mentors. Now you're judging. What about judging mentors? Oh, they were, well, particularly uh, Maxine Beam was excellent. Yeah. I think she probably taught me more than almost anybody else. And Herman Cox, uh, Louis Murr was tremendous. We got to spend time with Louis Murr, and he was an excellent teacher in uh, any number that I can can think of that were very, very helpful. Oh, and Maxine Beam was, I mean, she used to come to Canada quite a bit, and we got to know her quite well, and she was one of my very favorites. She was a great judge, but also a great character. So oh, oh, she was. She was quite a character, but she was... I never thought Maxine got the credit she should have as a judge. I, I agree with that. Yeah. She was absolute, and she was a great student of of dogs too. And and she told it. She didn't take any nonsense off of <laughs> anybody. That's for sure. You know, but. Uh, and there were a number of people that helped us um, with our judging. I think another judge that we learned a lot from was Hollis Wilson. Mm, oh. Do you remember him? I do. Irish Setter Man. Yeah. Irish Setter. And a wonderful judge and a good person. He really was. And Carly Harriman was, was a good 
mentor for us. <clears throat> And so was Mel Downing. Mel Downing was was uh, particularly for me. Everett Dean was good for me too. Do you have any story about how you met these certain people? Like I'd love to know how you first met Maxine. So. Well, actually, Max, we were showing dogs in Texas. We had moved to Mississippi. So we went to Texas frequently to show dogs. And Maxine also was showing at the time. So we knew Maxine from showing dogs together with her. So that's really how we got to know her. So... <laughs> And, and what about Hollis? How did you first meet Hollis Wilson? We met him up in Michigan when we were showing, and he was judging up there. And we got to meet him and talk with him, and he was very helpful. Well, that's the history and the education that you, you've gone through with the people you've mentioned. That's it's. It's a lifetime. It's invaluable. It's invaluable. It is. I think about it now, particularly like Louis Murr, to have spent the time with him. And he took a great interest in us and helping us. And he told us a lot about how he got his boys boys and how he trained them and bred them. And, and it, I mean, this is education you can't get anywhere else. I don't know that it's available today because I don't know that the people would listen that much if if they were around. I think I think back then we were all more students of the breeds than we are today. I agree. Too many distractions now and too many big ribbons to be won. So well if you think about it. Back in the day when we first started showing, you absolutely didn't have cluster shows. You showed in Kalamazoo one day and Grand Rapids the next day, or, you know, you traveled and, and you were all together more in the grooming area or the tanning area. So you had more time to look at each other's dogs and study them. Yeah, it was it was there was definitely more education back in those days. I remember being at the sportsman show and just sitting around listening to all these characters talk, and it was educational. So, so it was how Doctor Bob and you were judging, and it, what, who enjoyed it more? Or was it the same? Um, I think Bob did. It took me a while to get into judging. Yeah. And I was very nervous about it. Herman Cox said to me, oh, get over it. Just go in there and look at the dogs and point to the one you like. <laughs> <laughs> he, Herman, I, I learned, in fact, I have letters from Herman Cox that he wrote me. He was a great letter writer. And he would write me a number of letters, and I still have them. And he always addressed me as the kennel girl. I was always <laughs> Bob's kennel girl. So, but there are things, there are letters I treasure having from her. Oh, I'm sure. Earlier you had mentioned about some uh, events in the ring when you were showing dogs. I want to I want to know what those were. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, this is a very funny one. Bob was out judging somewhere, and Stuart had gone with it. And I was entered. I entered the dog to go to Florida. I think it, I'm not sure where in Florida it was, but I take the dog. I load him up. This was Cecil, and I go off. And Art Marsh, who was the field rep down there, knew I was coming. So I get there, and Art sees me, and he comes, and he says, all right, I've got you a place to set up. And I said, well, who's going to unload the car? And he said, I'll <laughs> hold the dog. You unloaded the car. So I do this, 
and I get through showing the dog in the class. There wasn't anybody else there, thank God. So now I go into the ring, and Ted Wormser is judging. Well, Ted loved the dog. And most of the people in the ring were all handlers. So I'm in there with the fox sound. And I take him down. I bring him back. And Cecil immediately jumps on Ted Wormser. And he has to push him off. Get down. Get down. He finally, Ted looks at me and he says, Polly, go stand over there in that corner and just stay there. And I said, Yes, sir. So I go over and stand there. Ted finishes judging the group. He picks his first. He picks his second. He looks over at me and says, all right, Polly, come over here the third now. (laughs) (laughs) And I forget who he picked for fourth. But anyhow, but I don't think we could get away with that today. I really don't. Oh, it's amazing what we did. Like we were talking about Maxine earlier, and I remember Maxine judging the national. I was at a national, and I had my new dog out, and my old dog. My father was showing my old dog because I'd won the veterans class with him. And when it was time to move them again, as she, after she made her cut, she went, "Dad, Dad, bring him up here. Let's see him go down and back." <laughs> yeah. Well, now I can tell you a story on my judging. I, I was a fairly new judge. I had whippets at the time, and I had I was judging up in Ohio somewhere. And Jerry and Elaine Rigdon were both in the ring showing their whippets. And I was trying to be so professional and everything. <laughs> and Jerry comes up, and I go over the whippet and send it down and back, and then I tell him to go around. And Jerry gets part of the way around and stops and turns around and says, Oh, where did you tell me to go? And I'm like, Oh, just be quiet here. I mean, those, and, and there were so many, I mean, Art Marsh was big for playing tricks on people or having handlers play tricks on people and Bobby Barlow was showing a Dalmatian one time and Art put uh, he always smoked a pipe and he put some of the ash on the Dalmatian before Bob Smith had to judge (laughs) (laughs) so it's just sort of things like that that we did and had fun with it was so much more fun back then. I I understand, you know, you're trying to keep it professional now, but oh my gosh, I had so much fun back then with people like that. <laughs> oh yes, we did. And I think we learned more because I think we we were more willing to um look at the dogs and discuss them and all this sort of thing than we yeah. are today. It's hard because people people get so offended now if you say something poorly about their dog. So. Oh, well, I can tell you a story. You talk about people getting offended, and I probably should have, but she, another person, and this is someone else who was, who helped us a great deal by showing and judging was Ruthie Cooper. Oh. And the first group placement that, Sam, which was our first dog, took, was down at Frank Booth's show. And he placed third in the hound group. Under, and I cannot remember the judge's name. He comes out of the ring. Now, remember, this was like an eight or nine month old puppy. And Ruthie looks at him and says, that is the most slab-sided dog I've ever seen. It looks like a flounder. <laughs> <laughs> and if you, oh Lord! But, and he was slab-sided. There was a question about it. <laughs> but okay. Ruth was Ruthie was someone else who just told it like it was. You know. Yeah. Well, there's no question. I, I remember sitting with her in the stands at PCA one year, and, uh, oh, it was an education just sitting there listening to her. So. 
Oh, it was. It was. And I, I, I'll tell you, somebody helped me with um, Pekingese judging was Carol Hollins. Ah, uh, sissy. I'm, <laughs> yeah, I adored Carol. She, yeah, she too. was just one of the most super people I think I have ever known, and a very, very good dog person. She sure was. Uh, well, she spent a lot of time showing dogs up in Canada, so I got to know her very well when she showed right. up to Dick and Dr. John. And uh, it, it was one of my very first wins. She had just started judging in America before she became a rep, but she did English setters at Cobo Hall, back when Cobo Hall was Cobo Hall. And uh, mm -hmm. she gave my dog the breed, and I still have that picture. It was one of my favorite wins because her her family's background English setters, and I just how I felt about her. So, yeah, that's a great name from the past. I, all these people, I wish I could still talk to. <laughs> oh, I do too. I yeah. do too. I and I think about them up there. We've lost so much of the knowledge and the history of our sport was with these people. Yeah, even just the character of our sport, it's it, it's it's it, it's 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 a loss for sure. So it is a loss, and I don't think we have the characters judging today. Desi and I'll say this to each other when we talk: we don't have these people judging, and I think that's something missing from this sport. No question. I don't know if they're. I don't know if, if they are allowed to be i'm sure there's characters that are judging that they just try not to let it out i don't think i think they feel they're not allowed to anymore so oh i think this is very true yeah and and you think about these people saying they want to know what we really think about their dog no they don't <laughs> you know there's no way they want to know what we think about some no. of them <laughs> they just want that ribbon <laughs> Right. That's what they want is that ribbon. So um, what what advice would you have if uh if someone that was came to you and said they wanted to start judging dogs? What advice would you give them? I think I would tell them to do a lot of studying on the breeds they want to judge and be willing to listen to criticism. Mm -hmm. And, and learn. And and that's something I, I, I don't know that I ever worry that much about what the field rep said. Somebody else that was a great help to us and dogs was George Ward. And George would watch Bob's judging. George would watch mine. And if he saw us doing something wrong he would be the first to say something about it yeah. and and so i think i learned a lot from everett dean in that i i think you have to stay a student constantly when you're um judging i think that's one of the important things to do oh there's no question i think if you stop learning you 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 put a halt to your level, you know. You you, you do. You, you got to keep learning. I I've only judged like I just started judging now, but I've only judged a few times. But I I'm I'm pretty sure I learn something new every time I judge. Oh, I think you do. I think even um, I don't think you're always know that you're learning something, but I think you are, regardless of um what dogs or what you're doing in the judging. I think you need to. I know Annie Clark told me this. I lost an English conquer one time when I was judging, and she said, you had the right one to begin with. You should have just put it up. You shouldn't have dawdled on it. You right. should have gone ahead and, and done what you wanted to do. And I think she was very right on that. Sometimes there's too much overthinking. That's all. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I How think we all. Oh, I'm sorry. I think we all do that. I think at times oh, we yourself. all yeah. overthink. Yeah, it's human nature. So, how long have you been all breed? 
Uh, I got my Albury license in 2007. Oh, okay. But remember, I could not get any breeds for a number of years when Bob was on the board of directors of oh, AKC. How long I was he on the board? He was on a total of about 10 years, I think. So... I bet you yeah, it must have been good starting your judging career as well. You were didn't start at the same time, but as a as a a couple because you could bounce ideas off each other. Did you did you ever argue about dogs? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> Frequently we argued about dogs. <laughs> so would you ever let him win the argument? Oh yes, he would win. <laughs> And, and I argued with, I mean, Steve Shaw was, uh, one time I had done um, Staffy Bulls. It was one of the first, may have been the first time I did it. And I'm sitting between Bob and Steve Shaw. And the Staffy comes in the ring and they said, who judged that? And I said, I did. And they said, well, you did a horrible job. You need to go back and study them more. <laughs> so you couldn't do that now without offending somebody. I'm sure you took that and thought, oh, well, but but you could never do oh, that. I, I took it one way. They were right. I did do a horrible job. <laughs> <laughs> Bob judged well, his first group was hounds, obviously. What was his hounds? Next? And then he went to sporting. And I think, and Bob said it, his favorite group to judge was the sporting dogs. Yeah. He really liked his sporting dogs a great deal. And his last group to judge was the working group. I always so. enjoyed showing sporting dogs to him. So I had fun. He was always fun to show too. Um, over your career, you've you've seen so many great dogs. Without mentioning dogs that are being campaigned now, what dogs are stuck in your head and as as templates for that breed? Oh, I it, particularly in, um, the one I remember drastic as just great was the Springer Spaniel of Julie Gasso's aristocrat. Oh, yeah. I think that dog that dog was starting out at the same time that we started showing our first foxhounds. So we were around him a great deal. And that was one of the greatest dogs I have have ever seen. And I think I think the the beagle that that Mike bred the the um Jimmy Beagle really set in my mind what I wanted in Beagles because That's he good. was, he was a, right there in your house. That's perfect. Right, right. And he was a funny little Beagle because to make him show, you had to take him up to a big dog and let him spar with it. <laughs> and when he would do that, then he would go right in the ring and show like a trooper. Otherwise, he didn't show at all. You need that testosterone to kick in. <laughs> right, right. So, you know, there have been any number of dogs, but I think aristocrat really stands out in my mind as, as um, a great dog. In um, the, I can't think of his name off, the White Standard, the Frank Sabella show, that was a great dog. In uh, there have been any number of them. So that's fun to, it's good to have that bank in your head of all these dogs you've seen. <laughs> Right. Draw back on them when I when I can. Even even dogs from when I was a kid. When you and you look back at pictures now and think, oh, well, it seemed different. <laughs> but it was it's it's, it's everything evolves. So it's it's in the it's in the moment. And and I think there's some dogs today that could come out and do very well. 
that were shown years ago. Oh, there's no question. Look at them, and you, you think there were some English setters that I look in the English setter book, and, and oh my, if they came out today, they would sure have a lot of fun. So That was another judge that we knew not as well as some of the others was Dr. Mitten, who was a big English setter breeder. And, uh, wow. We knew him too. So, so uh, what what's next for you? What have you What have you got coming up? You're always. I'm busy. off for three months. Oh, I'm just oh sitting gosh, here vegetating for three months, and then I start back judging. So, I'm not sorry to be home. I enjoy my house and. Yeah. Everything I can't be outside as much. It's so cold. But uh, you still have dog a dog? No, I don't have any dog. I I have um, actually they're not mine, but they're in my pasture. I have donkeys and some horses. Oh wow! And our neighbor has a big fo- horse farm, and uh, so and I have a cat. So I'm not. Totally without animals. Do you know you know what your next show is? Yeah, do you remember? Yes, it's the end of March down in Georgia. Oh, nice. um, so for some reason, be- I, I thought we were on a panel together somewhere. I can't remember. Oh well. Thanks. I don't know. Since we don't get um the printed um premium lists anymore. I never know who's on the panel till you get there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for some reason I was I thought I was looking at Info Dog and I, I think I thought I saw that. Oh my, I think I'm on a panel with Polly. That's great. So maybe I'm oh, wrong. That would I be wonderful. <laughs> I hope you are. And my next shows after that are up in Baltimore County at some that shows might, in April. That might be it. Maybe Baltimore. Because I I'm in Baltimore. Okay. Right? So Excellent. I knew I, I knew I'd saw your I saw your name somewhere. <laughs> well, I, I really appreciate your time, Polly, and I, I I know it took a while for us to get this organized, so I'm glad you helped me out and did this for me. So well, good, thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed it. We probably could talk for hours more. <laughs> we probably could, but then I get in trouble from Tom. I have too much time on there. Okay. <laughs> he never gives me trouble. He's great. <laughs> All right. Well, I look forward. I, I hope it's I hope it's Baltimore. I see you. That'll be great. Are you going to come to Westminster as well? No, I have a judging assignment that I had taken before I knew about the date oh. for Westminster. So I won't be there this year. Well, that's a shame. Well. <laughs> All right. Well, well, again, thank you so much for, for doing this for us. I'm sure everybody's going to be thrilled to catch up with you and see you. Thank you, Will. You have a good year. You too. Thank you, Polly. <laughs> it was great catching up with you. And you're the same witty person you've always been. I uh, really appreciate your time. If you like what you see here, make sure you press the like, share, and subscribe button. And don't forget about um, the podcast with Wayne Kavanaugh and myself. And if you want to get a hold of me, get a hold of me at dogshowtips at gmail.com. My website is Will Alexander's Dog Show Tips. And we'll see you next time.